As you take your seats this morning, I want to invite you to take a copy of the Bible and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as we continue in our series titled Life Together. If you're a guest with us uh, or if you're tuning in online for the first time, uh, one of the things that the, the way we typically preach is we preach through books of the Bible. And one of the reasons we do that is it allows us to, or in some ways forces us to cover topics that sometimes might be a little bit uncomfortable or might be ways that we're, or things that we're not used to talking about as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks is what Paul has to say specifically about marriage and singleness in our states as those. And one of the things that we realize, as we have already read and as we'll continue to read in the letter to the Corinthians, is that Paul is very concerned with how Christians treat their bodies. And why is this? It's because our bodies are created by God. And so... He gets to command what we do or do not do with our bodies. And as we get more specific, we know that God has created us male and female, and he has created marriage. And if you've looked ahead at the passage, you've seen that in chapter 7, Paul is going to get very direct about sexuality and the marriage relationship. And I'll warn you today that we're going to cover some things that may make us squirm. And the reason why is not because it's ugly, it's not because it's dirty, it's because it's things that we are not used to talking about. And I've done my best to be sensitive, and my intent today is not to shock, but to point us to what God has taught us, and to ultimately see another way that God has shown his goodness and grace. Now remember, this letter would have been read publicly with men and women and children likely present. So there was no pretense, there was no ignorance about anything in the human experience. And while it was a different culture, there was an openness to discussing things that we tend to avoid. Now some of you are sitting there going, man, I am glad it is not a family Sunday. But the reality is, is that we all need to hear this. And we need to understand what God says, albeit in an appropriate way, but see and understand that God has created marriage for specific purposes. So if you have your place there in 1 Corinthians 7, I invite you to stand as we read our passage this morning. I will be beginning in verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband." And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. 
In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for the good gift that marriage is and the gift that sexuality is, Father. We pray, Lord God, that we would be a people, Father, who have a correct understanding of it, Lord. And Father, that we would see, God, that it is pointing to a bigger purpose, a purpose that is revealed in the gospel and in your son, Jesus, and in his love and his relationship to the church, Father. Lord God, we ask that you would enlighten our hearts this morning, Father, to what you have to say to us through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So our main idea of the sermon this morning is that God created marriage to protect our sexual purity and help us understand the gospel. God created marriage to protect our sexual purity and help us understand the gospel. And so the first thing that Paul's going to teach us here in 1 Corinthians 7 is that marriage is meant to protect sexual purity. Marriage is meant to protect sexual purity. Now, as we move into chapter 7, and as we're going to make our way um, through chapter 14 specifically, Paul is responding specifically to some questions that the church at Corinth had asked him in a letter. That's why verse 1 contains a quote, because he's quoting back to them a question that they have asked, or a statement that they are asking him about. And so what that creates for us some challenges in interpreting this letter, or Paul's letters in general. New Testament scholars often compare it to listening to one side of a phone conversation. If you've done this, you know, if you've heard somebody talking on the phone, you hear what they're saying, and maybe you can kind of piece together what the other person is saying based on what you hear, but you can never be certain for sure. That's what's going on in, when we interpret Paul's letters. We have his side of the conversation, but we don't have necessarily the letter that they wrote him. So that's a little bit of the challenge in piecing this together and creating a little bit of some historical context. Look with me in verse 1 of chapter 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, and he quotes here, so we, we assume he's quoting from the letter, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So Paul is going to begin to speak directly here to the quote that he's been giving. Now, look for a minute at the extremes that seem to be going on here in Corinth. Last week, as Scott preached that he was preaching against sexual immorality. And now he's going to speak to those who are abstaining from sexual activity altogether. So we have people on either end of the spectrum. But as we're going to see and as we kind of glean, the two of these are related. So what likely has happened or what we think may be happening is that some portion of the Corinthian church has adopted some type of ascetic lifestyle to where they are doing without things in order to make themselves holy. And one of those would be sexual relationships, even if they are married, that they are abstaining from sex so that they could be made holy. But again, as Paul's going to teach, that is an incorrect understanding. Verse 2, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So it's not a coincidence that Paul is talking about sexuality and marriage right on the heels of the discussion he had in chapter 6. One of the things that may have been happening is that the partners in these relationships, if they happen to be married to one of these, one of these people who were engaging in this ascetic lifestyle, who was, who was abstaining from intimacy, that they would have gone outside their marriage relationship for sexual intimacy. In other words, going to prostitutes, as what seemed to be happening in chapter 6. And because these married couples were not together physically, they were going outside of the marriage relationship for intimacy. But Paul points out their error, because he's saying if you are abstaining out of a sense of godliness, 
then you are withholding a right from your spouse. And this totally turns everything on its head in this day because women didn't have rights in marriage, or at least not to the extent that Paul is speaking to here because he is saying specifically, women, you have wives, I should say, you have authority over your husband's body. Husbands, you have authority over your wife's body. And he's using the same language that he used in chapter 6. Remember, he said, Christ has authority over your body. You are not your own. So he's saying, husbands and wives, you are not your own. And by withholding intimacy from your spouse, you are defrauding them, he says. You are not giving them their right. Now, this does not mean that we, as husbands and wives, use this to manipulate your spouse. It doesn't mean that you withhold it or that you give it so that you get something in return. That's not what he's teaching here. And I want to say this real quickly. If we do commit sexual sin as married people, it is not our spouse's fault. We are responsible for our own sin. So Paul is not letting us off the hook here. But we need to understand that there is a specific expectation or specific teaching that he's giving us here of our bodies as married people. That in this mysterious union that we have in marriage, our bodies belong to our spouses. Verse 5, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, though you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. So Paul says that the only time it might be appropriate to abstain is when two people decide to do this, to spend time in prayer. But he says you don't have to do this. So this might be as a form of fasting. But he says you don't have to. But this might be the only thing I can think of as to why you might. But he says what's happening is as you abstain, that's going to continue to winnow away at your self-control and that you'll be tempted to go out your, outside your relationship to fulfill those sexual desires. And in the church, we've gotten this twisted because of the culture around us. Our culture around us has totally twisted the idea of sex and marriage. And so in some ways, we as the church have overcorrected in order to try to, uh, to make ourselves holy. We've come to look at sexuality as something dirty or something we should be embarrassed about. And we do need to be careful about when we talk about it and how we talk about it. But we need to remember that it is a good thing. Why do people have sexual desire anyway? Because God created us to have them, and he gave them to us. Way back in Genesis 2, when God created Adam and Eve, and he said that a man and a woman would leave their father and mother and become one flesh. Friends, sexuality existed before the fall. So we know that it is a good thing in the context of how God has designed it. It isn't something that is a distraction, but it is something to be enjoyed in the context of a marriage of a man and a woman for life. And as any other gift, it's meant to point us to the goodness of the one who created it and gave it to us. And our culture has taken this good gift and twisted it. And I would argue that we as the church and overcorrecting, have dealt with it in some ways that are unhealthy. Augustine, who has contributed much to Christian theology, I think gets it wrong because he teaches that we should only do these things when there's a particular end in mind. But that was because mostly due to his own promiscuity before he came to Christ. And the Bible spends a lot of time speaking and teaching about this. And as Paul is teaching us, is to protect our purity that it takes place in marriage. Turn with me back to the left in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs speaks a lot about human sexuality in the context of marriage and in our relationships with each other. But Proverbs chapter 5 begins talking about adultery and talking about sexuality outside the marriage relationship. But then he gives us the alternative. 
Not only is it to avoid adultery, it's to be together as man and husband and wife. As husband and wife, I should say. Proverbs 5, look at me in verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of her youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Now, some of you are going, I cannot believe you just read that out loud. <laughs> but the reality is this is the Bible and God is teaching us how we avoid sexual immorality. It's by taking part in being intimate as husbands and wives. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize that sexuality is a gift from God to be, experienced, to be expressed in marriage. God wants us to be satisfied with each other so that we don't go outside and become immoral, so that we don't turn to other people or turn to screens to fulfill a desire. As we've seen, pornography and its use is rampant in our society by both men and women. And when we look at what the Bible teaches about it and see that God has given us something that is so much better than the way the world portrays it. Now next we have to look carefully at what Paul says because if we read it incorrectly or too quickly, it seems that Paul is going to be anti-marriage, but he's not. Let's look at what he says in verse 7. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So at first glance, it sounds like Paul's bashing marriage, or at least he's anti-marriage. But look at what he's calling his own celibacy. He's not bashing marriage, or he's not throwing down on marriage. What he says about his own celibacy and his own singleness, he calls it a gift. And we might imply that he's celibate for different reasons. Maybe so that he could be an effective minister. But for some reason, he sees that his singleness is as a gift. But then he says, but not everyone has the same gift. Some of you have been called to the gift of marriage. So there he says, God gives different gifts to different people. Some have the gift of singleness. Some have the gift of marriage. And there are some who have the gift or have been called to the gift of marriage that are not yet married. Now, some of you are saying, my singleness doesn't feel much like a gift, and I totally understand that. And we'll speak to that in a couple of weeks. Paul deals with, people in, uh, deals with um, instructions to people who are single, and we will deal with those in a couple of weeks. But he says to those who have sexual desire and are unmarried, Paul tells them and instructs them to marry. So he says, get married so you can express those desires in the way that God intended. So unmarried people, here it is, get married. Our culture would say that to repress desire is unhealthy. Yet those who desire marriage but are not married are free to express the desire any way they want to. But the Bible expressly teaches differently. Listen as I read 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Those of us who follow Christ are called to live our lives differently because we are not our own. And whether we are married or single, we are called to control our bodies and desires. And one of the ways we do that is by marriage. But let's be clear. Keep in mind, sexual sin and lust will not go away once you're married. It's not like you get married one day and the next day every, all of your struggles go away. So don't misinterpret what Paul's saying. So we have to remember that marriage is not simply a means to an end. But it's also more than simply a physical union between two people. 
It's representative and illustrative of a much broader and much bigger truth. And that brings us to our next point that Paul is going to teach us here in verse 10. Is that marriage is a means of demonstrating and sharing the gospel. Marriage is a means of demonstrating and sharing the gospel. Look at verse 10. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. So he's saying what I'm about to teach you is not something that I've come up with on my own, but it's the teaching of Jesus. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. So now Paul has moved and is talking to believers who are married. And we know this because of how he addresses them beginning in verse 12. Now we should understand here that the words separate and divorce are used interchangeably. In our modern context now, the word separate is something that is done prior to a divorce becoming final. And Jesus uses these words a little bit differently too. Why, why is that? One, because the wife didn't necessarily have the right to divorce her husband legally. Only the whole husband could. So the wife could separate, which was as good as a divorce, but it might not be legally and in writing. It might have only been in practice. So that's why there's a little bit different uh, word, words used here. And as I said, he says, not I, but the Lord. The church, as they hear this, would have understood that he's reiterating something that Jesus had already taught about divorce. So what is he teaching? He's teaching that it's important for them to stay married. Now keep in mind, the reason they're probably contemplating divorce at this moment as two believers is that asceticism. I'm going to refrain from sexuality so that I could be more holy. And one of the ways that I can do that is divorce my spouse so that I can be more holy. Think about how backwards that sounds. But what Paul is doing is he's reiterating what Jesus had taught is that there is a spiritual nature to marriage. That yes, marriage involves a legal document in the eyes of the state, especially currently for us. When you get married, you have to go to the county and get a marriage license. And there's a marriage certificate that, that gets written down and it's recorded. But there is a spiritual nature to marriage that is not dissolved when divorce takes place in the eyes of the state. That's what Paul is teaching here and what Jesus had already taught. Listen as I read Matthew 5.32 real quickly when Jesus is teaching on this. He says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's again, he's speaking to the Jewish tradition for divorce. And he says what happens is if you divorce your wife or if you divorce your spouse, except for on grounds of immorality, you make your spouse commit adultery. And furthermore, if you marry someone who's been divorced, you cause that person to commit adultery. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Because there is a spiritual union between two married people that is not dissolved when, it, when divorce takes place. As I've said, because there is a spiritual nature there. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 tells us what marriage is pointing to and why this is so important. Listen as I read that. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So this spiritual nature, this spiritual bond between a man who is married, uh, or to a man and woman who are married, this spiritual bond is reflective of the gospel, and it's reflective of Jesus and the church. That's what Paul teaches here in Ephesians 5 when he quotes Genesis 2. He says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So that means that marriage exists. One of the reasons that it exists, when God created it way back in Genesis 2, 
is so that it would show and represent the love that Christ has for his church. So do the math. Before the fall of man, which is where Genesis 2 happens, we see the fall of man in Genesis 3. God created marriage in Genesis 2. So before the fall of man, before sin had even entered the world, God created marriage so that it would one day show the love Christ would have for his church. Before the need for Christ was evident, God was planning and showing us and giving us a glimpse of his redemptive work in Jesus. And that is why a marriage between a man and a woman for life is so important. So how does marriage do this? Ephesians 5 tells us how husbands and wives are to live. Husbands are to love your wives as Christ loves the church. In other words, be willing to die for her, to nourish her. Wives, respect your husbands as we are to respect Christ. It's a joyful sacrifice that mimics the sacrifice that Christ has made for the church. He went to the cross and died so that we could be forgiven of our sin and was raised from the dead, bringing in the age of the church as we know it now. And if we repent of our sin and have faith in Christ, then we will one day be resurrected as he was to eternal life. So when a man and a woman are married together for life under the lordship of Christ, loving each other, forgiving each other, enduring with each other, then that shows the world what the gospel looks like. We work through conflict with our spouses that eventually brings reconciliation, which portrays the reconciliation that we have with God through Christ. When we split from each other, and the world sees that, then we see that there's nothing different about us than there is from the world. There's nothing compelling about that. Again, there are exceptions for immorality. But we are not to divorce if we are to represent Christ and his gospel. Now, as a side note, and I spoke to this some a few weeks ago, this has been misapplied in situations of abuse, and that is wrong. If your spouse is abusing you, particularly physically, that is a criminal act. And that is not loving or respecting your spouse in any sense of the word. Prominent Christian leaders, and you can find it in the news if you want, have counseled wives to go back to husbands after they've been beaten because of these words. That is not a godly husband at all. This is not to say that divorce is commanded in those instances, but there is a process that needs to be worked through. And if you have questions about this or how we might apply that, I'd be glad to talk with you about that later. Now, some of you here today have been divorced. And we understand that there is grief and there is pain that comes with that. And as your brothers and sisters in Christ, we grieve along with you. But the good news is that there is grace and divorce does not make you a second-class citizen. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. God redeems, and he works in that. And if you are divorced, it is not the end of your story. And we believe that God can and will still use this, use you, as there is forgiveness and grace in Jesus. Paul then moves to address those who are in mixed marriages, meaning one who is a believer and one is a non-believer. Look with me in verse 12. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Now, he changes here. He says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord. And when he says rest, you know, we might question up front who's he talking about. Uh, then he quickly says, you know, those who is an, married to a brother, meaning a Christian, a follower of Christ, who's married to an unbeliever. Now, when he says, I, not the Lord, he's not saying what this means is it's not Scripture. It doesn't mean it's not in, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, I've told you what Jesus said, but what I'm about to teach you is something Jesus had not spoken to specifically. It's still Scripture. It's still the Bible. We are still bound to it. But he's just saying, here's some new teaching that Jesus had not given us. Doesn't mean what he says is more important than Jesus. That's one of the reasons we believe that all Scripture is the same. It's one of the reasons, as a side note here, no extra charge for this, one of the reasons I don't like the words of Christ in red. 
reason for that is somehow that to me in my mind means that that highlights pieces of Scripture over others. All Scripture is God-breathed. Now, if you have a Bible with red letters, not condemning that's not sinful, just a personal preference. But we just need to understand all Scripture is breathed out by God, whether it was something Jesus said or something Paul said. Paul's not God, but again, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Verse 13. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So here's the situation. People who are pagan, who are not followers of Christ in Corinth, have now gotten saved. And in this instance, we have Christians, or people who have become Christians, that are married to an unbeliever, where the husband got saved, but the wife did not. Or the wife got saved, and the husband has not. And so they believe, the belief is, I can't be with an unbelieving spouse. Somehow this unbelieving spouse is going to contaminate me. He's going to make me unclean. So I need to get divorced and split from this person. And Paul's saying, no, it's actually the exact opposite. You don't need to be worried about them defiling you. The reality is, is your testimony as a follower of Christ is going to then, hopefully, win your unbelieving spouse to Jesus. That's what he's teaching here. Now, he's not saying in the language, when we read this, it may sound at first that he's saying you might save your husband. He says, will you save your husband? He's not teaching that the believing spouse can somehow save their unbelieving spouse. But he's saying the life and the testimony that you lead is going to cause that person or Jesus will use that, God will use that to draw them to himself. Listen is what I, Peter speaks to this very thing. Listen as I read to it. 1 Peter 3. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, so even if your husbands, who are not Christians, don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So what Peter is doing is reiterating what Paul is teaching. If you're married to an unbeliever, stay married to that unbeliever so that they might see your good deeds. And as Jesus said, glorify your Father who is in heaven. And many of you have stories and have experienced this in your own home. I've heard stories of some of you in this room who have shared. Your mom got saved. And because your mom got saved, your dad got saved. And now you're all walking with the Lord because God used a faithful wife or husband, to minister to an unbelieving spouse. Now, this is a principle. It's not given as a guarantee. Well, how do we know that? Because Paul says that there's, he makes a stipulation that if they want out and they want to leave, to let them go and to be at peace. You are not enslaved to them. So we take this as a principle that is a good thing that God may do, but we do not take it as a guarantee. So let's draw some application here. How should we then live? We have to ask ourselves, are we pursuing marriages that seek purity and display the gospel? Are we pursuing marriages that seek purity and display the gospel? So there are two purposes of marriage that we have talked about today, sexual purity and the gospel, both representing the gospel and ministering in the gospel. But marriage won't automatically do these things if we simply try to let them. No relationship will ever grow or meet its purpose if we try to do things when we have time or just try to let it. The physical intimacy between a husband and wife is going to be the result of a relationship that is continually cultivated. At its core, intimacy is a communication of love between two people who are married. And it communicates the health of the relationship. It represents the health of your marriage. It means it's going to be a result of a relationship that is worked on continually, in which both spouses are receiving what they need in all aspects of your marriage. 
You can't expect to be intimate and then ignore each other the rest of the time. That's not how this works. It means that Ephesians 5 is taking place in the home where the wife is being loved and nurtured and husbands are being loved and respected. So husbands and wives need to take time to cultivate your relationship. You need to talk to each other. And parents of young kids, I know that this is challenging, but you must make time, schedule it if you have to, put it on the calendar, make it a part of your routine for where children are not around for you to continue and talk. One of the things that um, Heather and I did when I was working from home during COVID and it's continued even some now, uh, when she would get home about five o'clock, we actually came to call it our five o'clock conference where we would sit and we would talk about our day for about 20 minutes. Um, now, our kids are older, and we realize that they are able to go do other things, and so this might not work for you. But at the end of the day, we sat down, we spent 20 minutes where we were able to talk about this happened today, this happened today, we need to do this, and then we were able to go back and uh, be with our kids and, and eat supper, or whatever we we're going to do the rest of the evening. But we had those 15, 20 minutes to sit and to talk. And when we communicate, we need to do so respectfully. Don't be a conversational narcissist. You hear one thing your spouse says, oh, that's nice. Well, let me tell you this. There's some give and there's some take. Where both are being heard and you're communicating. Much is said about date nights. And this is a great way to cultivate communication. As I said, a date night, though, doesn't have to be going out. It can be picking up takeout after the kids have gone to bed. And sitting at the kitchen table over takeout and talking. Or sitting and eating takeout, watching reruns of the office. Whatever it is you want to do. Whatever it is that you're able to communicate and bond over and enjoy. One of the things that's become a little bit of a date for us is going to the hardware store. Or going to uh, Harris Teeter together. Our kids are at an age now where they can stay home a little bit by themselves. And we use those opportunities as a time to be together and to talk. That's what works for us. It may not work for you. You have to look at your life stage and understand. Look at your schedule. Well, how might this work? And we, as church families, need to be willing to keep each other's kids so mom and dads can go out and spend time together. It's a great way for us to love each other and to love our families and strengthen our church by helping to strengthen and solidify marriages. Families with young kids alternate one week, one couple watches all the kids. The next week, another couple. Maybe ways for us to do that. This is especially important for kids who are out of, for families whose kids are out of the home. My experience, I remember, I and mean, some of you probably had something similar. When I graduated high school, there were several families and pe- people who were my age when I, in, in our church who they happened to be the youngest of their siblings. And as soon as they graduated, their parents split up because the kids were the only connective tissue that they had. And once kids were out of the home, they split up. Married couples whose kids are gone, you need to have something that is connecting you. Your relationship with Christ is that, but there also has to be time where you are spending together. And it's going to happen more quickly than we realize whether it's in a gift or an event, do something to where your spouse will feel loved. Men, if you don't buy your wife a new spinner reel, if that's not what she wants. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Communicate love in the way that they understand it, what speaks love to them. How do you treat your spouse in public? Do you roll your eyes when they speak? You make jokes about each other at each other's expense when other people are around. We might speak sarcastically about each other, and there's times when we can joke, but we forget that oftentimes in reality, we're cutting each other deeply, and it embarrasses people, especially in front of other people. Speak highly and lovingly of your spouse when other people are around. And those that are not married, I need you to listen to what I say here. Through the purity movement of the church in recent years, Especially when I was coming up years ago, much of the focus was on the consequences of not following God's plan for sex and sexuality. And those are real consequences. Those are a reality that we need to talk about. 
But what I hope you've seen today and what I hope you understand is that the real reason for doing this is because God's plan is so much better than the world's. And if you are not married and you want to be, then we pray that God grants your desire in giving you a godly spouse. Stay involved in our church. And we, as your brothers and sisters in Christ, want to make sure that you are integrated into our church family. And we'll say more about this in a couple of weeks. But we want those of you who are not married to be a vital part of our church fellowship. If your marriage is struggling, come talk to us. We want to help. We can speak with you. We can counsel. We can pray with you. We can walk with you through whatever your marriage may be facing. We can get, connect, get you connected with Christian and biblical counselors if we need to. But please do not struggle in silence and in isolation. Again, don't give Satan a foothold for temptation. We know that Christ loves his church, and we know that he will continue to grow it and cultivate it. And if we want to see that here at Seven Oaks, then our marriages must follow in kind in the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for the gifts that you've given us. We thank you for the gift of sexuality, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that you have given us exactly the ways it needs to be practiced, Father, and in your plans, Lord. Father, we ask that you would protect us from temptation, Lord. We ask, Father, that we would, uh, that we would take the steps necessary, Father, to stay within the bounds and in the boundaries that you've created, doing so willfully and joyfully, Father. Help us, Lord, to fall on your grace in the times when we fail, Father, helping us to remember that you love us no matter what and that you're there when we repent and follow you. And, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.